from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Being a book reviewer, I'm sometimes asked which books of our time are likely to survive into the next century? What, which novels are going to become classics? And always the first books I think of are the novels of Marilyn Robinson. When, when Housekeeping appeared in 1980, it, it, I think it, it just, people felt bouleversé, as they say in French, overwhelmed by the, the beauty, the poetry, the strangeness of this book. We had to wait for many years before a second novel came out, but Gilead, in its way, was, is just as memorable and even more serenely beautiful to read and to learn from. And I think uh, this is true of her, all, her, all her work, not just her novels. The third novel is, of course, Home. But Marilyn Robinson is also an essayist of great power and seriousness and conviction. She writes about the religious life, about the religious dimension of all our lives, about politics, about the serious matters of the 20th and 21st century. Her latest book is, When I Was a Child, I Read Books. It's a collection of essays on just these themes. She said that uh, she will talk briefly about the book, but really welcomes questions from the audience. So please think of questions you would like to ask her about her work, in particular about uh, the essays in this book, if you already know it, and uh, prepare to enjoy the next 45 or 50 minutes. So without further ado, let me uh, present the very distinguished novelist and essayist, Marilyn Robinson. Hello, it's wonderful to be here. This is a, a beautiful event that I think all of us are enjoying very much. Um, this book, uh, when I was a child, I read books. It sort of sounds autobiographical and it is really not. I will read a little bit from the one essay that is in some degree autobiographical. Um, it's actually a collection of, of lectures that I've given under various circumstances over a number of years. Um, I, uh, the, the fact that people think that I actually sort of wrote the book from beginning to end implies to me that I've been obsessed by the same things for many years. Um, I've enjoyed it, you know. But um, I find that it has been um, incredibly stimulating for me as a novelist to also um, be interested, to let myself indulge my interests in theology and history and economics and all sorts of other things, I feel as if uh, it, it widens my mind in a way that's absolutely necessary to my being able to write fiction that I can consider authentic, actually my own and not something that simply moves a set of received ideas farther down the generational line, you know. Um, in any case, I'll read very briefly from When I Was a Child, the title essay, and um, then I, I truly appreciate questions from the audience. That's when I find out what it would be of interest to you to hear me talk about. So, when I was a child, I read books. My reading was not indiscriminate. I preferred books that were old and thick and hard. I made vocabulary lists. Surprising as it may seem, I had friends, some of whom read more than I did. I knew a good deal about Constantinople and the Cromwell Revolution and chivalry. There was little here that was relevant to my experience, but the shelves of northern Idaho groaned with just the sort of dull old books I craved so I cannot have been alone in these enthusiasms. Relevance was precisely not an issue for me. I looked to Galilee for meaning and to Spokane for orthodonture, and beyond that, the world where I was, I found entirely sufficient. It may seem strange to begin a talk about the West in terms of old books that had nothing Western about them, 
and of naive fabrications of stodgily fantastical authoritative worlds which answered only to my own forming notions of meaning and importance. But I think it was in fact peculiarly Western to feel no tie of particularity to any single past or history, to experience that much underrated thing called deracination, the meditative free appreciation of whatever comes under one's eye without any need to make such tedious judgments as mine and not mine. I went to college in New England and I have lived in Massachusetts for 20 years and I find that the hardest work in the world, it may in fact be impossible, is to persuade Easterners that growing up in the West is not intellectually crippling. <laughs> yes. On learning that I am from Idaho, people have not infrequently asked, then how were you able to write a book? <laughs> Once or twice, when I felt cynical or lazy, I have replied, I went to Brown, <laughs> thinking that might appease them, only to be asked, how did you manage to get into Brown? <laughs> One woman on learning of my origins said, but there has to be talent in the family somewhere. <laughs> in a way, housekeeping is meant as a sort of demonstration of the intellectual culture of my childhood. It was my intention to make only those allusions that would have been available to my narrator, Ruth, if she were me at her age, more or less. The classical allusions, Carthage sown with salt and the sowing of dragon's teeth which sprouted into armed men, stories that Ruthie combines, were both in the Latin textbook we used at Coeur d'Alene High School. My brother David brought home the fact that God is a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose some, uh, circumference is nowhere. I never thought to ask him where he found it. Emily Dickinson and the Bible were blessedly unavoidable. There are not many references in housekeeping to sources other than these few, though it is a very elusive book because the narrator deploys every resource she has to make the world comprehensible. Idaho society at that time at least seemed to lack the sense of social class, which elsewhere makes culture a system of signs and passwords more or less entirely without meaning except as it identifies groups and subgroups. I think it is indifference to these codes among Westerners that makes Easterners think they are without culture. These are relative differences, of course, and wherever accident grants a little reprieve from some human folly, it must be assumed that time is running out and the immunity is about to disappear. And now, if I could invite questions, I would appreciate that. What was I doing during those 24 years? <laughs> That is my most frequently asked question, as they say. And the answer is that I was satisfying my free-range curiosities, basically. I was, I was learning things I felt I need to know before I could proceed with writing. And I wrote about the things I was learning in that course of, in that time. My daughter graduated from Bard College this spring and she's making a reverse journey today to Missoula, Montana. And she studied fiction and, and writing and is a, a fan of your work as am I. One of the things that she struggles with because she's lived in many places is how, how does place inform a, a writer's work? And if you could speak to that in your own experience. You, t you talked a little bit about it with what you read for us just now. Yes. Well, it's interesting. The first book, Housekeeping, uh, was based on the, really very much the landscape where I grew up, the mountains, the, the uh, big lake, you know, the, 
uh, even details of vegetation and so far as I could remember them, that was all as, as faithful as it could be because um, that was the sort of ancestral homeland of my family. And uh, we all made something out of the fact of that place, often pictures, paintings, sometimes the really bad ones, you know. But um, it, I was assuming that I was writing an unpublishable book that would basically be read by people in my family. So um, it had everything to do with evoking this shared landscape of ours. Um, and then, you know, um, I was asked to teach in Iowa. And I was very, I wanted to go there because of the, the writing program is so interesting. Um, but I'd never lived in the Middle West. I had no conception of the place at all. I was completely surprised to find myself not only being there, but wanting to stay. <laughs> not part of my life plan, you know. Um, and so the way that I found into the landscape was to read the history of the place, which starts really in the, in the 1820s, you know. And then uh, also to uh, learn to look at the landscape, to get beyond the aesthetics of New England on the one hand and the far west on the other, and look at this sort of quiet, sumptuous landscape that is so sky dominated and so, so verdant, you know. Um, and, and to understand where the towns, I mean, why the towns are founded in the place where they are, what the history of the building of the places is and so on. And I found a very rich, very beautiful history that I really had not had any rumor of before. And it made me start loving the landscape because I could see it in those human terms. And then I became capable of writing about the landscape because it was more than a simple place to me. It was a, a, a narrative, a human habitation in a rich sense. So I think that you can adopt a landscape um, as well as inherit one, you know, and, and that uh, the experience can be as rich in either case. Uh. Hello. Um, I'm an Episcopal minister who coordinates an interfaith book group, and I had read your book, Gilead, a number of years before I suggested to our interfaith book group that we read your book as a group so that the non-Christians in the group would learn about the theology of Christianity, which you so movingly write about in Gilead. And one of our questions was, what was the source of your character, the, the Reverend John Ames? Because one thing, you're a woman and you're writing so clearly from a man's experience, and that was another intriguing experience, but also your moving descriptions of communion and baptism. You know, is there a personal experience that gave you those ways to describe that, or, or did you have a source from a, from a friend or colleague? Um, well, you know, I'm a very, I have belonged to the same church for about a quarter of a century now. The pre previous church I only belonged to for about 20 years. I'm, I'm, a, I'm always there, you know, I'm one of those pillars that they talk about. Um, so I've spent a lot of my time for the usual reasons, just sort of observing and pondering religious culture. Um, but John Ames just came to me, I don't know why. I never had any problem writing from his point of view. Um, when you think how many men have ri written great female characters, there's really no reason that a woman can't write from a male point of view, you know. I look at Tolstoy and Shakespeare, you know. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I didn't expect to do it, but I didn't encounter difficulty doing it either. Something that I would like to say that um, is new in my experience and very important to me is that, that my books have come out now in the Arabic languages and in Persian. They're being read in the Arab countries and in Iran. And apparently the attraction that they feel to them, and I guess they're doing well, is the religious sensibility. I think that if we could step back from sectarianisms, we would understand that there is a, a huge, broad, participation in religious consciousness. And I, I'm, I'm thrilled that these, that these books are being enthusiastically reviewed in Egypt. I mean, this is wonderful, you know? And, and uh, I think that uh, 
We, we talk about religions misunderstanding each other and we ignore the fact that at a very profound level they do understand each other. And I think if we put the emphasis in another place, we could untangle a lot of the conflicts that are so destructive and unnecessary now. Yes. Uh, your essay uh, in this book, The Fate of Ideas, mm -hmm. it, it seemed to me that a lot of its success was that you were sort of outside the guild writing about Hebrew scriptures. And you sort of make that point. Uh, I'm not inside the Old Testament guild. But I'm wondering if you've had any response from the guild. Are there Old Testament scholars or, or Hebrew scripture scholars that have, have enjoyed it or taken offense at it or responded to it in any way? Or do you have a sense of, of how it's, it's played out? I really don't, you know? I mean, I get invited to uh, theological events and so on, and I go to them, and I, I take it as a, you know, they're collegial in their relationship to me, but nobody ever says anything outright, either objecting or confirming what I, uh, objecting to or confirming what I say. Um, I, I would, I have a, sometimes a sort of provocative edge in my essay, and what I'm trying to do is, get somebody, you know, shake something loose, make somebody say, oh, you're absolutely wrong, you know? I don't get that. I also don't get any uh, pats on the head either, mm, you know? <laughs> you're welcome. Hi, uh, I've been reading housekeeping for a long time, over and over again, and every time I have a talk with one of my friends and I think they might like it, I give it to them, and then I reread it, and Gilead, I'm not quite that familiar with yet. It'll probably take another 24 years to, <laughs> for me to really get Gilead and home into my, my subconscious. But what I want to ask you is, and it just came to me, uh, you spoke in somewhere, I read that, that you really like Moby Dick, and you think housekeeping maybe is sort of like having a Moby Dick for women in a way. <laughs> and so that inspired me to read Moby Dick at my advanced stage, because I'd never read it before. I thought it was a man's book, and, and I just couldn't get into it. And lo and behold, with patience and with those wonderful pictures by Rockwell Kent, I was able to read Moby Dick almost as, as with as much enjoyment as housekeeping. So I want to know if you have any other literary recommendations for me. <laughs> well, you know, all those wonderful contemporaries of Melville's, I recommend them all. I teach them all, all the time. I mean, if you, if, if you haven't read Leaves of Grass lately, I recommend that. It's a lot of splendid stuff. And then, of course, there's Wallace Stevens and there's uh, William Faulkner. Faulkner. Yeah, he's a poet. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> what I, my brother, I think, is the one that sort of tipped off the public that I was comparing myself to Moby Dick, which I would not normally do, except when you're talking to your brother. And <laughs> and what I said to him was, I wanted to write a book that men could read without realizing all the characters are female in the same way that I read Moby Dick without it being an issue for me that all the characters are male. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah? Call me Ishmael. <laughs> so Gilead is a book that has meant so much to me and I know probably to a lot of people. And I guess I have sort of an imaginary narrative of, of how it came to be in those years. And I wondered if you could tell us a little about what it was like to write it, how much you knew about it when you started it, whether you knew what it was when you, when you sat down to write it. What, what, I how, really, how did that book yeah. come to be? Well, you know, I was, um, I was invited to uh, be at the Fine Arts Work Center in um, Provincetown, Massachusetts. And I told them that I would come if I could come just before Christmas. And then my, my sons, neither of whom was married at the time, could come and spend Christmas with me in Provincetown. So we got these, I got rooms for us in this old empty hotel. But my, my sons were late coming. They got, both got delayed. So I spent days alone in, in an 
empty hotel on the tip of the continent, you know, with this amazing sea light pouring in the windows and so on. And um, I just started thinking of this, you know, it's so hard to describe. This image came to my mind of an elderly man who I knew immediately was a pastor writing a letter to a boy that's playing on the floor by his feet. And I, that's where it started. That was the initial information I had. And then the whole rest of it is simply the uh, unweaving in a certain sense of what was implied in that moment. I'm curious about the, uh, I guess I call it the blowback to your essay, The Death of Adam. I realize this goes back a few years now, mm -hmm. but I thought that was quite wonderful, talking about evolution as an open-ended adventure. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if the, you know, the Daniel Dennett's uh, of the world came back at you about that. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I mean, how provocative can I be? And still, you know, yeah, but maybe they're just being nice. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. May I on this side, please? Oh, who was there first? Okay. Mrs. Roth, what a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. I joined the lady who spoke before my love of housekeeping and I reread it very often and I, the, I'm just so drawn to the, to the sisters, to the aunt, to the setting, to the house, to the river, to the railroad bridge. The entire thing it just is so intriguing. Uh, so could you just tell me a little bit about the setting of the house and the, and the, the, whole, the entire family. It's, it, it's one of my favorite books. In my dotage, I read it and reread it. I love it dearly. Thank you. So Thank you. Um, well, you know, it is set in a, I mean, topographically, the setting is a town of Sandpoint, Idaho, which is where my, my, my parents lived as children and where my great-grandparents settled and all that. Um, it's uh, not at all autobiographical. My mother wants you to know that. <laughs> but um, I, as I say in this book, there is a very, very strong emotional music, in effect, that lives in what appear to other people to be essentially uninhabited places, you know? Um, and I wanted to find a way to render the kind of beauty that there is, which is a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult place for people, for people to live. It always has been. Um, the wilderness out, you know, the, the size of the wilderness relative to the size of human population, it's completely disproportionate, you know. Um, and uh, the effect of that is to create a sort of animism, I think, in the consciousness that experiences it, that the mountains feel so alive. And, and the lake feels so somehow intentional, even if you don't always feel reassured by its intentions, you know? And um, so it was a, in, in many, many specifics, it's a work of evocation rather than portraiture. Um, but the house, you know, the, the bedroom that opens into an orchard and the painted dresser and all that, that was my grandmother's house. <laughs> yes? Um. So two themes seemingly unrelated uh, in your recent book are, first of all, the kind of paranoia and tribalism that's become entrenched in, in modern politics and culture, and the reductionism um, of a kind of science that, since we know so much about it now, seems to quantify the things that can't necessarily uh, be quantified. But I think a common feature of these two problems is a lack of or a blindness to grace. Um, and as we know, grace is a gift, but I wonder, as a writer, what do you see as the potential in writing to restore or reveal some of that, which is all around us, but 
uh, seemingly is, is so hard to see? Well, you know, uh, one, if I could do, I, 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 I think all the time I talk to my students about the fact that as individual people, our existence is statistically impossible. There's virtually no likelihood that you will exist as yourself, you know? Um, we're a, a, an anomalous planet in a huge, roaring explosion of a cosmos. You know, with, with our little lives going on in this reliable daily basis for the most part, you know, we have, our brains are the most complex object known to exist in the universe. Every single person has in his, her head, the most complex thing known to exist in the universe. It seems to me as if awe is appropriate. It, it seems to me as if, if we pondered what we are, the, the impulse not only to respect ourselves, but to respect each other would be very much enhanced. And um, we have a way, of, it's a habit, it's a cultural habit of speaking very disparagingly about people today or whatever the category is, uh, under no circumstances is disparagement appropriate. Maybe tears are appropriate sometimes, but never dismissal, never undervaluing of the seriousness and importance of a human life, you know? We should, we're here briefly. We are extraordinarily exceptional. It's a beautiful thing that we're involved in, however else you want to describe it. The, our, our sort of systematic expunging of a, the candid expression of joy. This is all sad to me. Uh, the, the diminishing of the a, a sense of the aesthetic as, a, as an ordinary feature of life. Talk about grace, you know. Um, and then, of course, there is dear old science, which I love and follow. But the genius of science is that it's always pointing out where it's wrong. And it advances by its the beautiful model of thought in that way. But you know, these deterministic notions that we've had about genetics and so on aren't true because science has found out things that complicate them almost infinitely, you know? So there is a, a tendency to try to impose this very hard carapace on human being, human experience, and science as much as anything else disrupts it, you know? And we have to simply be aware we do not have a reductionist, a true, verifiable, legitimate reductionist definition of human being, you know? You're welcome. Uh, hi. I'm asking for a friend who couldn't be here today. Okay. Um, the question is, referring to the Gilead and home, do or did you have a prodigal in your life? I don't. I mean, maybe I do, and I just love them too much to be aware of it. <laughs> no, no. Hi, I'm not sure exactly how to frame this, but given the evocativeness of homecoming, um, what is the role of empathy do you feel in a, in a writer's creativity to not live that experience, but to be able to create it so powerfully? I think, I mean, I'm only speculating also. Every once in a while I think, you know, my heart is heavy over what is happening to these people and they don't exist, you know? <laughs> and every misery they have, I have to claim authorship of, you know? But, um, I think that probably, I'm speculating, that we do develop a sort of category of empathy, a, a catalog of it, I mean to say. You know, we know that the mind mirrors what it sees in terms of emotion and expression. And uh, I, I, I think that over time, our imaginations become fluent in the creation of, you know, of, of emotional tempers that we've seen, and it become a palette for us. If I could amplify on that question asked earlier about the prodigal in your life, I was curious about that too. If you could talk a little bit about the brother-sister relationship in home, and also when did you get the idea to write home? 
I mean, when you were writing Gilead, did you always know you were going to do more with Jack? Or, you know, if you could talk a little bit about both. Okay. Well, you know, I always promised myself I would not write a sequel. And I didn't, did I? Because they're simultaneous. But um, the, um, I, w I was not intending to write home, but the characters of Jack and Glory and Old Bowden were so strong in my mind, you know, they needed a book. It was, they had, they had a right to a book. So, uh, so I wrote that book, and it, in ways it sort of amplified issues for me that in Gilead that I felt uh, perhaps I had not developed in quite the way I should have, or in the degree I should have. Um, as far as, the, I, I happen, I have one brother, my only sibling, and um, he has been very, very important to me. And uh, it, it occurred to me that I had not seen a brother-sister relationship as adult people. I couldn't think of one, you know? And, and of course the odds are that most sisters have brothers and vice versa, and, and, and that these are intense relationships of one kind or another. Um, my brother is highly respectable. He's a professor of art history. He's not a, <laughs> he's not like Jack at all. Except that there is that, uh, that, that bond of familiarity that is nevertheless um, a kind of polite adult ceremonial uh, familiarity, you know? Uh, it's hard to describe, it's, but I tried. Well, just one other quick question. Um, I heard Jane Smiley say once if she could do a thousand acres or whatever that one was, she would rewrite it a different way. And I just wondered, uh, you know, of the three works we're talking about here, uh, are there any that if you went back to, you would take apart and do a different way? Oh, no. Sometimes when I'm reading housekeeping, I come to a sentence that I never got right, to, you know, and I remember it's there, you know, the little weak place and the creaking place, the soft place. But, you know, I think that probably my impulses at that age were as good and reliable as my impulses at this age, and so I'm just going to let it be. I belong to a book group. And the book, when I read Housekeeping, was just wonderful. I thought about the, the evocative nature of it. Didn't have any sense of judgment about the characters at all. I was really surprised by the discussion when people started talking about homelessness and the irresponsibility of the parents. And I was just totally shocked because I wasn't thinking about any of those issues at all while I was reading the book. So what I wanted to ask you was whether the social issues that it, it, it um, introduces were part of your thoughts about creating the book? They really were not, or even in a sort of inverse way they were, because um, one of the things that uh, was true of where I lived when I lived there is that there were lots of people, I mean really a, a fair part of a small population, who were completely indifferent to the norms of conventional life. You know, they lived in cabins in the woods, They had nothing, wanted nothing, hunted, fished, you know. There, there's sort of, of, of a survival population, no doubt, from original people that originally settled there. Um, and um, they were often very well read, or, you know, they had, or they carved beautiful things, or they did all sorts of other things, and knew the woods utterly, and so on, and they had a very respected place. Um, and I, I sort of grew up thinking that a life that is pared down in that sense is, a, is very beautiful. When I read Walden in high school, I thought, well, of course, a cabin in the woods, perfect, you know? Um, and, and, but then people do impose these other, uh, and they're often meant to be benevolent, but they can be incredibly condescending to people who have simply made other choices. You know, Put on a different hat to ask a question. Um, I went to Oberlin College, one of the, the great colleges of this country, and you've become very interested in the traditions behind small liberal arts colleges of the Midwest, particularly the theological 
uh, traditions. You talk about Charles Finney, who was the president of Oberlin and one of the great orators of the 19th century and, and thinkers. What led you to these, uh, uh, these great um, profound minds of the 19th century who are, no, who are really neglected by the modern world? Because it does seem you have a kind of theological imagination that is rare among contemporary writers. I think perhaps of, oh, Jeffrey Hill, the poet, is someone similar who has that kind of depth. Um, and I guess it all goes back to, you know, what led you to become interested in Calvin and some of the naughtier, naughtier with a K, not with an N-A-U-G-H, <laughs> questions of, of religious um, speculation. Well, these things are kind of simultaneous. All these years I have taught whatever else I'm doing, you know, and, and, and people kind of expect me to stop teaching and, and write, and that's reasonable enough, but I get so much from teaching. And, but when I was first in the Middle West, one of the things that I noticed is that there are these little New England colleges all over the landscape. Often the oldest building that you see is one of these little colleges that could have come out of Connecticut or Massachusetts. And um, I thought, how was this place settled? That it seems that the first thing people got around to was starting a college. I mean, I, it's probably a unique settlement pattern in the whole history of the world, you know? So I started reading about the histories of these colleges and it turns out that they were uh, founded by people like like Finney or the, there's two groups of divinity students that came out of Yale, one called the Yale Band, one called the Iowa Band, who simply came into the Middle West to set up these I ideal educational communities that would be part of the Underground Railroad, that was very important, that they would publish abolitionist material because this was a, an abolitionist movement. The Yale Divinity School was huge on this. And uh, they, they started classic liberal arts education. The theory was, the fact was, that they would start a church and start a university, a college, I should say, and then they, got, they bought land from the government in the first instance. It raised the value of the land enormously to have people wanted to be near these things when they settled in the Middle West. So they took the difference and they used it to start another college or to endow the one they'd started, you know. These things have a very high survival rate, Carleton and Knox and so on. And uh, they, they continue to be very fine. And Oberlin, of course, is a, a very vivid example of this. And they were, they were manual labor system colleges, which meant that everybody on the faculty and everybody in the student body did all the work that was done to maintain these little academic villages. So, you know, the president of the university slaughtered the hogs, you know. Um, this manual labor system was quite common in the United States. The only surviving example is Berea that I'm aware of, and it uh, was founded by people from Oberlin. The Oberlin became a uh, center of abolitionism and also a founding of colleges. So it had, there was a second generation of Oberlin colleges and also simply little towns that became part of the Underground Railroad, which is a much larger phenomenon than we, than we ever acknowledge that it was. But in any case, um, so I started researching these colleges and then I got a sort of who's who of large thinking in the 19th century, you know. And uh, at the same time, I was teaching Moby Dick and uh, it occurred to me that, he, that that book is saturated with theology and I had never read the theology it would have been saturated with, which is Calvin. And which is not to say he's rephrasing it or anything like that, but it's what he's in conversation with, you know. So I was reading the Institutes on one hand and Moby Dick on the other, found them enormously mutually illuminating. And uh, since these people that I'm talking about that were the founders of these colleges and towns and so on were all Calvinists coming out of the New England tradition, it all snicked together very nicely for me. And since I had a Presbyterian childhood and a congregational adulthood, I was also, for the first time, reading the major theology in my own tradition. Snick. <laughs> um, I recently finished your book, Home, and I wondered what you thought Old Bowton's um, part in young Jack's inability to 
get his life together was. Um, I guess I wondered whether you thought he really had a part in young Jack's inability to change. Um, and so I just wondered what you thought about that. Right. Well, you know, I am interested in trying to sort of loosen the apparent determinism of the way that we think about things like that. I know lots of wonderful people who have pretty difficult children. I know lots of difficult people who have perfectly wonderful children, you know. And assuming that there's some sort of causal relationship among these things, I think it's too complex for us ever to, to, to figure out, you know. Uh, I, I love all this new research about epigenetics, you know, where you, you inherit some flaw of your grandfather's or something. It's so bizarre that we're talking about that now, but there it is, you know. Um, and I think that we have to relax and accept the fact that there's an interior logic to one's life and one is accountable and also excusable in degrees and ways we don't know. <clears throat> Hello, over here. Um, I, I, I may be, I, I don't know if there are any other Iowans in the crowd. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm originally from Missouri, but I spent a lot of my adult life in Iowa. Two of my children are born there, my wife is from there, and her, all of her family. Last summer we were at the Iowa uh, Des Moines, uh, Iowa State Fair and received the uh, a, a, 100, a century farm marker oh, for our farm. Congratulations. For the farm there. And um, so there's a long history. Uh, and I resonated with um, uh, Gilead. Uh, and I've often wondered why. Um, and I, 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 as I was sitting here reflecting on that, I was wondering if what I was resonating with was a kind of simplicity, not a simpleness of life, but a simplicity of, um, of, of, of simple things and simple ways of being. And you know, what, what I, I loved about both Gilead and home was the journey into some of my own simplicity and how difficult that is. And I think what I enjoyed reading why I enjoyed reading your books was because <clears throat> they were in a way kind of healing because they brought me back to a place where I could be a, a bit more simple. And, and I wondered if, if that was, if, if you resonate with that at all or if you have any comments about that. Uh, well, one of the things that's, uh, you know, very interesting um, about Iowa, about the Middle West is that that it, it, there's a lot of small town culture there. There are huge cities, but there are a lot of small town cultures spread over the landscape. Towns that survive through crashes and droughts and everything in the world. And uh, people uh, have often beautiful libraries. Um, I have a friend who's an organ builder, and he says, you go into one of these little towns, you can find three major organs, you know. Um, there's a very quiet, very um, unnoticed richness. And, and maybe because uh, there are fewer distractions of some kind, there are more intensity of other kinds, you know. Um, and I've developed a, an enormous respect, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, there's, there's a lot of loveliness about that. And of course towns vary and people vary and all the rest of it. But Iowa can be very impressive in a simple way. You know, I mean, a, a quiet, unflashy way. No ostentation there at all. Good afternoon. I was wondering when you were discussing about uh, your research of the small colleges in the Midwest, whether you considered writing a nonfiction book about that. It sounds like it might be fascinating. You know, I, I would like to do it, but you know, the time is so finite. It is really something that you have to sort of consider. A book takes a long time. I wish somebody else would do it because there's, <laughs> I really do. I mean, it's wonderful. There's a whole archipelago of little colleges 
that have fascinating shared histories. You know, Edward Beecher was here and there. You know, Charles Finney was here and there. And, and uh, they have an ethos, an aesthetic, a culture that is very con as consistent as the Ivy League, certainly, you know. And they're mutually unaware, which is so bizarre. And I went to Illinois College, which is the oldest college west of the Mississippi River, where Edward Beecher was the president of the college. And I said, you must have great archives. And they said, well, there are some boxes of things. And there's an old guy that said he was going to sort through them. And, you know, it could be anything. It could be anything. Um, but it's a, a lost and very beautiful piece of American history. I was reading some history of the settlement of Iowa and came across something that surprised me, and that was that a lot of the early ministers, the preachers in the small towns, were women because the men weren't willing to go out into the countryside to these you know, small places and, st and start churches. So a lot of the original, um, I think, congregational churches were started by women. I wonder if you had found that, um, read some of those books as well, and, and thought about what that meant in terms of the development of place and culture. Right. That, you know, oddly enough, maybe because I read 19th century sources, but that tends to be underrepresented in my reading. I'm in, interested to know that. One of the things that I, I like about that tradition is that they ordained their first woman in 1853. So they have a very long history of uh, the involvement of women. And women, you know, they support, they tend to be the bone and marrow of virtually any religious organization if they're allowed to be at all, you know. So it's, it's never surprising that they're important. Yes? Okay, um, question for you. You are in a pantheon, uh, I've been identified, you know, in a pantheon of Graham Greene and Walker Percy and that, that group, um, eh, rightly or wrongly. But what I'm trying to figure out as I read you, and, and not as much as the others um, so far, but um, how would you distinguish what makes your writing or their writing Christian or religious or spiritual? And can you give me an example of a good a writer you respect and enjoy where that element is pretty much absent? Well, I think that the di distinction between religious and secular is a lot harder to make than people generally act as if it were. Um, one of the things that's true is that most English language literature has scriptural resonances in it just because they're so embedded in the language. I admire all kinds of writers. I mean, I don't know how, I, I certainly prefer, say, a Faulkner to Graham Greene and so on, you know. I mean, I'm not looking for, I, I feel that anything that is deeply, justly perceived as religion by any definition I would use you know, and now I, I'm getting a sign here from this kind lady, so goodbye. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.